Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In Matthew's Gospel, it's the teaching you follow that controls how you understand what you see. So when false Christs and false prophets arise and show great signs and wonders, your only hope is to hear what Jesus told you in advance. The truth is not out there. On the contrary, the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may follow it. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 23 to 28. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 375 of the Bible as Literature podcast. In last week's episode, we did not deal with this question of the elect in verse 22 of Matthew 24 because it's just not a big deal. Theologians make a big deal out of it. But since we know that many of you have read theologians who make a big deal out of this word elect— we just want to put it to bed for you before we move on. In the Old Testament, when God strikes the city, he always leaves just a few people around after he's done so that there's someone there to tell people what he did. <laughs> so for their sake, he's going to make the execution quick, but then he's going to leave them so that they can tell everybody else God destroyed Jerusalem. That's the function of the elect. They're not special. They're not chosen because they're righteous. They're not going to be gathered up while everybody else burns. That's not what this is about. This isn't about predestination or chosenness or elitism or rapturism or any of that nonsense. This is about God keeping a few people around to do his bidding which is to warn everybody that they're next. Yeah, it's all about the testimony. If you remember in the beginning of Job, when Job's children are killed and their families are killed, there's always a servant or two that's left behind, and they come and tell Job, by the way, your child and all of his family were killed. That's his job. Now, is it because this was such a good servant, or he was so pious, or is it, it doesn't matter, actually, what he is, how good he is, how bad he is. The only important thing is that he's there to spread the word. He's a witness. When a pack of wolves attacks your sheep, you may have a couple ears and a tail left over from your sheep. That's the remnant. Is it good news that you have an ear and a tail? No. You had a sheep, and now you no longer have a sheep. It's a testimony to what the wolves did. It's not just a disappearance. You know it's dead. And here, when we have the elect that are saved, they're just there as a witness to bear testimony to the fact that God destroyed the city. The other thing to keep in mind is that we've been referring to the people living in Jerusalem here in Matthew 23 and 24 as those who fancy themselves the remnant. But that's the problem. They are the ones who remain in Jerusalem at this moment in the Gospel of Matthew. But instead of preaching the kingdom, they're preaching Jerusalem because they believe that they were put there to save Jerusalem and to build it up and to preserve it and to keep it pure and all of those things the text has been criticizing. We are learning now what the real remnant is. It's classic. You have it in American movies where someone comes in, commits mass murder, and leaves one person alive to send a message. That's how you have to understand it. And once you see the mechanism, which is very common in the prophetic tradition, 
you immediately avoid the trap of talking about the elect like it's some kind of a club that you join because you're special. Honestly, you don't want to join that club that survives the nuclear holocaust. You don't. When you watch post-apocalyptic films, there's always a character who secretly wishes that they were taken with the explosion so that they wouldn't have to survive through the experience of being a member of the remnant. It's not good news. So it was important to call that out, Richard, because people have invented entire religions around this nonsense. And we have to stick with the text. The text isn't inventing a religion. The text is tearing down Jerusalem in your heart so that you can look to God's heavenly city for direction. Then, if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. And I want to be quick here, Richard, to correct the translation. A better translation would be, Here is the Christ, or there he is, don't trust him. Verse 23, once again, is about where you place your trust. And trust in Matthew 24 ultimately pertains to preparedness. You can't prepare by getting supplies. You can't prepare by making sure to grab your coat before you head out. You prepare by placing your trust in God's instruction and in the voice of the shepherd. If you want to know where the Christ is, you don't look out there into the world and see if he showed up on CNN or Fox News. You look into the text, into the scroll of the teaching, and you place your trust in that teaching as your reference point for the coming kingdom. And then no one will be able to fool you. In the Greek, it just says, do not trust. Are you not supposed to trust the man who said this to you? Or are you not supposed to trust that supposed Christ, the supposed Messiah? The Greek leaves it ambiguous. It's precisely as you say, Father, you can't trust either. Don't trust the guy who appears to be the Messiah or the guy who tells you, oh, yes, indeed, this is the Messiah. You can't trust either because there's only one place you're allowed to put your trust, and that's in Scripture. You need this Scripture inside of you as your guidance. Last night I was teaching Hosea again, and just this emphasis that God is this mauling bear in chapter 13 of Hosea who rips open your heart. I love that because it has two meanings. One, it tears open your heart like a marauding bear, meaning you're dead, <laughs> and he brings destruction. But also the fact that he cracks open where your heart resides, he needs to replace that thinking with correct thinking. He needs to take out the center of your thinking and intelligence and place in his word and put a heart inside of you that has this inscribed on it, then you can finally think correctly. You have to have this scripture inside of you, inside your brain, so that's the only thing that you're thinking. It makes no sense then to trust somebody who says, oh, here's the Christ, and then you get excited. What do you mean this is the Christ? The scripture says you're supposed to go to the hills. I'm going to the hills. That guy's not going to help because scripture says, go to the hills. That's what I'm going to do. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the eclectos, the elect. This once again reminds me of Deuteronomy chapter 13 about the guy who comes to town with a bag of tricks. The law of Moses in that moment prescribes that you should check the law of Moses. <laughs> and if everything he said about his bag of tricks turns out to be true, but works against the law, then you throw the guy out because your reference is the law. And here the remnant are brought back into the equation because of what's at stake. 
you are the witnesses to God's judgment and destruction, you're supposed to be following the voice of the shepherd, and now you're going to follow a charlatan? That's the worst possible thing, because the only reason God kept you around was to bear witness. And now you're going to follow after some floozy who's giving you an alternate interpretation as to why the walls came tumbling down? We're moving away from the temple toward the scroll. We're moving away from Sinai toward the desert. The pillar of fire in the wilderness is the light of God's instruction. It is the movement of the fire and the smoke on the mountain into the wilderness without the mountain. So now that Jesus has consolidated the destruction of the mountain, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of your physical, institutional, measurable reference, worldly reference for God's majesty. Now that we're finally headed out toward the wilderness, we are once again returning to the question of what you trust, what your reference is, where the real city is located. It's not on a map. It's in a scroll. Great signs and wonders. You and I have been talking about the crowds and how the crowds are so easily wooed by signs and wonders all throughout Matthew, and we were talking about it in Mark. That is something typical of the masses in the Gospels. This is not good, and this is precisely why Matthew finally just lays it out, because false Christ, pseudo Christi, and false prophets, pseudo profite, can also create signs and wonders. Signs and wonders cannot be a reference point because those bearing false gospels, false teachings, can also produce them. I mean, you see this in Exodus. Moses was able to do a trick, and so were the priests of Egypt were able to do the same trick. Now, maybe the snake was not as big when the priests of Egypt did it as opposed to Moses, but they're still able to do signs and wonders. So if priests of Egypt can do signs of wonders, if false prophets and false Christ can do signs and wonders, they cannot be the reference point. You see this to the present day. I mean, the Orthodox, the Catholics, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, if someone is able to show some healing or show some miraculous this or miraculous that, or so-and-so was able to perform some amazing thing or speak in tongues or whatever, this is supposedly evidence of the Holy Spirit. According to Matthew 24, 24, it could also be evidence of a false prophet or a false Christ. You cannot trust it. You cannot trust it. If someone says, come to this church because they've got wonder working X, Y, Z, you cannot trust it unless you understand Scripture as your reference point, in which case you're not trusting that thing. You're trusting Scripture. This is the only thing you're allowed to trust. I, I'm running out of words. Fortunately, Matthew is still coming up with them. This is what's central. In Scripture, the sign that is given to the prophet Jonah is not out there. The sign is in the scroll, but you have to think of the scroll like the soundtrack of a movie. You hear the words spoken, and suddenly those words assign meaning to what you see. Imagine you're in a movie theater. If you try to watch the film without sound, you will not understand what is happening. You will see everything, but it won't mean anything. There's no way you can figure out the meaning of the story by simply looking at a bunch of moving pictures. They are not a sign of anything. It's just light and color. That's what idolatry is. And in the absence of a word spoken, you're just seeing yourself and these images on the screen. But when the audio is turned on, you can suddenly read the signs. There is a meaning associated with what you're seeing, but that meaning is controlled by what you hear. This is what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew. You're going to see lots of things. The only thing you should concern yourself with is the meaning that the scroll assigns to what you see. And if you understand that, you will never be fooled by what you see. You will simply trust what you hear. 
And then when you look out into the world at the moving pictures, you can recognize what the scroll assigns as a sign of God's will, what the scroll assigns as the sign of judgment and destruction, and what the scroll assigns as the sign of the false Christ. That's the trick. But all of this depends on your trust in what is written in the scroll and your steadfast adherence to the discipline of hearing what is written, which is the voice of the shepherd calling you out of Jerusalem into the wilderness. Jesus has been doing his best to move the people away from, as you said, Father, believing their eyes to believing their ears. When Jesus argued with the scribes and Pharisees, he told them, have you not read? If they wanted to bring up some action of his that they disagreed with, he would not start with their perception of the matter. He would start with what Scripture says. And Jesus would not argue this or that action. He argued Scripture. How do you understand Scripture? He's told this before. That's why I'm getting frustrated trying to come up with new ways of talking about this. Signs and wonders don't matter. Scripture alone matters. Behold, I have told you in advance. I am on the record saying this, which means that you have no excuse on that day. So if they say to you, behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them, do not trust them, do not go and see. And don't quote to me the passage from John that says, come and see, because you don't understand what that text is saying. Both Matthew and John do not want you to go and see. Both Matthew and John want you to hear what is in the scroll so that when you look up, you are not fooled. I have to keep repeating this because I know that deep down inside, people still think something is out there. Let me explain to you what's out there. It depends on whether you're a conservative or a liberal in the United States. That's why you think that there are alternate facts. If you look to yourself to understand what you see, what you're going to see out there is what is already in you. And that is why people are absolutely baffled by what's staring them in the face and they can deny what they see because they're projecting their personal truth onto the universe. I've said this many times, personal truth is not aspirational. It is your default setting as an earth mammal. A shared understanding of the world is aspirational, which means you have to put your personal truth and your individualism on the shelf. Scripture is challenging you not to project your movie onto reality, but to submit to its instruction, which controls your reality. So don't trust anybody who tells you to go see for yourself. Seeing is not believing, friends. This is the scripture that's supposed to be written on your heart. This is supposed to be in your back pocket at all times, the scripture. Not your personal relationship. The scripture is what's in your back pocket that you're supposed to be pulling out. If you ever have a question about what to do next, you pull out scripture in order to understand. When you have a moment, you study scripture to make sure you don't get caught unaware and you're always prepared. This is what you keep with you. And, Father, that there's nothing out there that's going to save you. I mean, the fact that Christians can say in this country, if we get this president, then we'll get these judges and it will save our nation. No. That is absolutely false. There couldn't be anything farther from the truth. There is no president that's going to further Christianity in this country. It cannot happen. It cannot happen. It can further your Christian culture, but, as Jesus would say, don't trust them. Don't trust them. If someone says this president is going to help us, don't trust them. 
If someone says, if you only listen to this preacher, don't trust them. If they say that this law, if we just get it passed, it's going to save our nation, don't trust them. Flee to the hills when it's time to flee to the hills, but do not look for a Christ, some Messiah, some anointed one that's somehow going to help you become more Christian or further your culture or make your people safer or whatever this is. This is false. Those people want to build another Jerusalem. And Jesus just said, there is not going to be one of these stones standing on another. Whatever that false Christ, false prophet is teaching cannot stand. The collective truth that you say, Father, that is aspirational is this text. We all stand together at attention, in silence, and we listen. And this becomes all of our truth at the same time. What can bring us together except this text? Facebook and Twitter and Instagram know exactly what our personal truths are. They have an algorithm. Those personal truths, they call them demographics and data so that they serve us up whatever facts are going to click with us. They know how to nurture our personal truth. But the one thing they have not been able to do is nurture that collective truth that is aspirational, that this scripture actually aspires to do. When you start to think that if only our nation confessed Christ, if only we could send out more missionaries, so more Muslims and more Jews and more atheists would confess Christ, then everything would be good. You're wrong. You are wrong. That will not make things better. The only thing that can make things better, if you submit to this text, submit to the neighbor who is standing next to you, hearing this text, and the two of you submit to this text and therefore submit to one another. That is the only place where this is going to happen. Revival is not going to happen in America. Revival can only happen inside the church as those in the church become one mind in this text. Even in the Gospel of Matthew, where you are being challenged to follow the shepherd into the wilderness, to follow Jesus into a lonely place, to follow Jesus to the Erimos, the desert, the place of desolation. Even in Matthew, you are being warned. Don't assume that because someone's in the wilderness that you should follow them. It's a pointed example. You can't make out of anything an ontological truth. Everything is functional. Just like you ask which city when you say you're a citizen of the kingdom, you have to ask which wilderness when you say you're following the Christ in the wilderness. And by which, I don't mean geographically which. I mean, how does this function relative to the only reference point, which is the text? It's not the wilderness that's the thing any more than it's Jerusalem that's the thing. It's the wilderness of the gospel that is the thing. It is the temple and the city of the gospel that is the thing. It is the kingdom in the gospel that is our city. And it's in the gospel teaching. It's in the scroll of the prophets in Ezekiel where the city's name can be the Lord is there. You can never call New York City the Lord is there because you're going to do what Constantine did. You're going to put a cross over the entrance to New York City and you're still going to have prostitution and greed and abuse. You're still going to mistreat people who don't fit into your city etc., etc. It won't work in your city. It will never work. But people in your city can submit to and pertain to the heavenly city so that despite the flaws of the earthly city, there are those who conduct themselves according to a different set of principles, guidelines, and rules. That's how it works. 
We have to get this into our head. This is what's behind the famous Anglo-Saxon myth of Robin Hood. This idea that the king is gone, but there are some people who still conduct themselves as though the king is here. And those people act differently. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. The example of lightning flashing from one end to the other is a beautiful metaphor. It's typical of the Old Testament where you try to say that something is all-encompassing. The Lord's throne is in the heavens and his footstool is in the earth. Here in this example, what Matthew is telling you is that if you are familiar with his teaching, you will know it when you see it because you have been told in advance. And it will be obvious, but the key here is not that you look for lightning. Come on, people. If you're still looking for lightning, there's no hope for you. If you still want to make the case that there's a difference between the border of the United States and the border of a Roman province, there's no hope for you. There's no hope. Unless you can prove to me that you don't need a visa to travel in 2021. Then maybe we can talk. Don't be fooled by the fireworks. So in a way, verse 27, which plays on this prophetic symbolism, is a test in and of itself. I love also the way that you put it. You don't have to look for lightning. You don't have to go out to the desert or the secret room. But there is nothing as great a display as lightning when you're in the desert. One thing that everyone can agree on in that desert, whatever religion, whatever background, whatever ethnicity, whatever set of beliefs is, yes, indeed, that was lightning just now. <laughs> everyone can agree that there was a flash of light. It's not a shooting star that maybe you caught a glimpse of or maybe you didn't. It's lightning. Everybody saw it. When we said a moment ago that you both hear the same thing when you hear the gospel read and you both agree and you both testify to the same words and the same phenomenon that you just heard. That's what it's like to see the lightning. So when the Son of Man comes back, don't worry, you're not going to miss it. <laughs> it's not going to It's not gonna happen and you're going to not be paying attention. He's saying you don't have to pay attention when the Son of Man comes. You're going to know he's there. Be prepared for when he does come, but don't worry. When he comes, you'll know. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather, the eagles will gather. No one makes an announcement to the vultures, to the eagles. Lo, come, there's a carcass, and explains to them how there's a carcass that's coming, and, and they can come and have a carcass if they come. No, the eagles just know. They can even tell from the way that an animal or a person is walking that there's soon going to be a carcass. They just know. Just like the lightning, you don't have to be special to know that this is the Son of Man. Everyone's just going to know. Your training is not in Messiah recognizing. Your training is in Scripture so that you're ready when he does come. Scripture is there so you know what to do next. And there's a twist here that underscores the importance of hearing and not seeing. Because if you're looking for the anointed one of Psalm 2, why would you be looking for a corpse? Why? Now, on the one hand, it's an example where the corpse is, there the eagles or the vultures will be gathered, meaning that there'll be a bunch of ruckus wherever this is happening. But that example itself in this context begs the question, why would you refer to the victorious Messiah as a dead body? You're never going to recognize the crucified Messiah as the Son of Man in this text if you're not listening to this text. No one is going to see someone hanging on the cross as their victor. It's not possible. You cannot. It's not a question of religion or theology or understanding. It is impossible to see someone on a cross as the victor unless Scripture is telling you he's the victor. <laughs> That's the trick. 
Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.